Good morning, everybody. This is officially day one of the journey. So it's 5 a.m. I'm in Maricopa, Arizona, just outside Phoenix, and we're heading to the uh, train station to grab our first train to New Orleans. And that's gonna take us, I think it's 36 hours. I think we get in tomorrow night. So we're gonna go across the country in the southernmost Amtrak route. And let me check in when we get to the train or the station and there's a little bit more light. Cause this is a lot darker than I was expecting. I'll uh, see you guys up there. just got checked in and the train should be here soon I think it's coming from that way about 40 minutes late from when we were supposed to leave Definitely got lost <laughs> right out of the gate into the train. Alright. Just got a text from my social media manager. She'll be happy to know I'm taking lots of video on the train. But let me get settled in and then we'll be right back. Alright, all nice and settled, got my pack in the room met, and I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a tour of my home for the next 36 hours or so. Um, this is a room mat, which is the smallest option in a sleeper car on Amtrak. Uh, two very nice chairs that recline, and then we'll turn into a bed. 
if I push down on this lever over here. So this is one of the beds. And then up there is bed number two, which I will not be using for sleeping. I think I can pull this down. Because it's very narrow. So there's that net over there that you can use to um, keep yourself from falling out. You can move, you move it to the other side, obviously. Um, but I will probably just use that for storage. And got a pretty nice view out there. So just had breakfast in the dining car. One of the great things about traveling by Amtrak is that when you are in the overnight cabin, you get free meals. So I'll probably, yeah, because I got, I caught breakfast this morning. I'll be getting uh, six meals on the trip to New Orleans because we get in tomorrow night. And um, in New Orleans, sorry. Got distracted by the scenery. It's very pretty out here. Or at least I think it is. So very small room. Um, you've got over there where that light is, underneath is the uh, temperature controls. Got some lights up at the ceiling, and that's a reading light for the upstairs bed. Uh, these curtains here are the privacy curtains and the door locks, so on the other side is a hallway, and there's roomettes on both sides of this car. Um, got my Trader Joe snacks, and then here is, probably should have tried to do this earlier before filming, but this is supposed to fold out. That is a tray table. Um, let's see if I can get it with both hands. I'm sure there's some sort of a release that I'm not pressing. Anyway, that folds out into a table. You can see the little instructions here. So I'm going to turn the camera off and figure it out. Alright, there we go. Got it to unfold. And I got my coffee from earlier. There is like a checkerboard pattern on here, so if you had like checkers or a chess piece and a friend, you could play a game. I don't have any of those things, so I can't play chess or checkers. Anyway, <laughs> I have friends. They're just not here. Um, it was just being, you know, it's not like... Yeah, I'll figure that out later. It's a little bit, um, you know, well loved and used. So here is, you know, safety instructions like they've got for the uh, airplanes. And then this is the menu for our trip. Uh, breakfast up here in the top, top corner. Their signature French toast, omelet, scrambled eggs, continental breakfast, um, bacon, sausage, stuff for sides, and then Caesar salad, grilled cheese, burger, or chili for lunch, and then they've got a kid's menu and beverages. Um, and then back here is the dinner menu, which is a three-course dinner, and you get a choice of lobster, crab cake, green chili, cheese, tamale, uh, mixed green salad, or, and then for entrees, you've got a steak, chicken breast, salmon, or tortellini with pesto cream. And dessert is the flourless chocolate torte, which is apparently incredible. Everyone raves about that. Uh, or a cheesecake or carrot cake. And then I believe one, yeah, one alcoholic beverage is complimentary with dinner, and then all soft, drink, uh, soft drinks are complimentary the entire time. So, quite a nice little choice. Um, probably, I did the scramble eggs this morning. It was supposed to come with potatoes and a croissant, but I don't think the guy realized it. He was kind of confused. I said with everything on the scrambled eggs and he just like didn't realize that stuff came with it anyway it was good I've got snacks and um, pillows and I'm just gonna set up and settle in in a few hours I'll go have lunch uh, that's about it so we can see a uh, see a hot air balloon out there as we go to we're in between Maricopa and Tucson Arizona right now A little bit of a hey everybody so we are back we're still on the train um, but I'm back with you now after um, after lunch we have 
just crossed into New Mexico and are about to get to Lordsburg, which if you were, uh, if you've been a subscriber of the channel for a while, will remember from the beginning of the CDT where that was the first town um, on trail, 82 or 87 miles in, forgot which, it's a couple miles of trail in the town as it is. So anyway, so that was where I got dropped off by my buddy Shane. Uh, well, he, we went there, he dropped me off at the border, and then I hiked back to Lordsburg, and then continued north up to the Canadian border from there. So, it'd be uh, kind of cool to roll through. I don't think we're going to be anywhere near where I stayed um, at the Econo Lodge, but um, did walk underneath these train tracks, I think, or over. I don't remember. Anyway, not important. Um, so, one of the things that I wanted to kind of, like, open up for discussion, um, and having hiked for a couple of years, it was um, surprising to me how many uh, different terms and other things are specific to long distance hiking. And I wanted to kind of talk about some of the terminology that I'll be using on trail, because in the moment I'm not going to think about like how to, or you know, to, to clarify what I'm saying. Um, so I figured I would help um, everyone get up to speed, excuse me. Help everyone get up to speed on that and um, kind of lay the groundwork for any other questions that you guys might have about how I do things, how logistics work on the trail, and uh, techniques or strategies that I am employing. So um, definitely would encourage you guys to ask as many questions as you want. I love talking about hiking and I would um, love to be able to answer your questions. So please ask away. Um, so, but to get back to the point, <clears throat> what I guess the best way to start about is just talk about what I'm going to be doing. So, hiking the Appalachian Trail, aka the AT, um, northbound. So, I'm going to be starting in the south on the summit of Springer Mountain in Georgia, and then hiking to the summit of Katahdin Mountain in Baxter State Park, Maine. And that is a northbound hike, also known as Nobo. Uh, southbound hike is known as Sobo, and that's kind of, you know, you're referred to as a Nobo or a Sobo. So if I, you know, oh, they're a Sobo, that means that's another through hiker that is hiking the opposite direction that I am. And I guess that's another good transition, a through hiker. So a through hiker is somebody that hikes the entire trail. Um, with the AT, that's going to be all 2,200-ish miles. Um, for other trails, it's just, you know, I guess technically if it's a, you know, a two mile loop, you can be a through hiker, but it's typically a, re a term reserved for trails, I'd say like a hundred miles or longer. Um, something you're going to take like at least a week to do, um, and have to really plan out. Uh, you're not going to, you're not going to get, you know, people claiming to be a through hiker after, uh, going up Old Rag in Shenandoah or something like that, which is a nine mile loop. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Section hikers are people that are doing a part of the trail. So that could be, you know, a couple anywhere from a couple days to uh, I've seen weeks or months, uh, month long trips. You'll uh, hear the term lash, which is a long ass section hiker. And those are usually people that are out there for the month or more periods of time. Uh, a lot of times people will be uh, you know, teachers or college students and they get the summers off so they'll come out on the trail and do whatever they can in their free time and then go back to work and uh, chip away the next summer. Then there are day hikers and those are just people that are out for the day. Uh, they're typically just carrying a little bit of food and water and um, they don't have any plans to stay overnight going back to their car um, right after they're done. And Okay, folks, our next station stop coming up here just a little less than 10 Sorry minutes will be Lordsburg, New Mexico. This guy's if been Lordsburg, getting pretty aggro. your final destination, please gather your belongings and be prepared to detrain. This is going to be a quick stop for Lordsburg passengers only. Once again, coming up in just under 10 minutes, Lordsburg, New Mexico. Thank you. So, um, those are the different types of hikers. A little bit of competition between everybody I'd say the through hikers are generally seen as the most hardcore and then descending I try to be nice to everybody because the day hikers have food and water that they might be willing to share so never gonna uh, never gonna risk that opportunity um, let's see 
So in terms of like the day-to-day -day stuff, a lot of times what I'll do is refer to a day by the number of miles that I'm going to be hiking. So I'm going to say something, you know, it'll be like, oh yeah, we did a, we're going to do a 20 miler or we're going to do, we did a, you know, a marathon, which would be 26 miles um, or, you know, only going to do a 10. The, just, you're know, referring to the number, calling A and then a number is usually just that's how many miles in a day or a section. Um, because everything revolves around how many miles are you knocking out every day uh, to keep on pace to make sure that you make it north before uh, the winter shuts the trail down. Um, the other thing related to distance are, um, so like I, I mentioned a marathon, a marathon day is uh, 26 miles. It's because a marathon is 26 miles long. Uh, Nero is a term and zero is another term to describe days. So a zero is a zero day or a day where you don't hike. <clears throat> it might be a day where you came in from the trail the day before, you need to be, uh, rest a little bit or just, you know, whatever, you want to take a day off. And that would be that day in town that you don't do anything, you might be resupplying, might be, you know, doing other things, going to get an injury looked out or some medication, something like that. And then you hike the next day. Uh, a Nero is the combination of near and zero. So typically this is going to refer to a day where you hike 10 miles or less. There's no fixed definition and so a lot of people will try to you know make fun of each other and say things like oh yeah anything less than 20 is a Nero because you try to you know anything less than 20 is a Nero implying that anybody that doesn't hike at least 20 miles in a day is lazy for lack of a better term it's uh you know like i said everything revolves around the miles so it's kind of like a badge of honor or like uh proving yourself the more miles you do the more badass you're you're seen to be and so uh, nero is something that people try to avoid zeros are something that people try to avoid i think that's foolish because you need to be able to take a rest it's an important part of the entire process um and then i think for distance wise that's about it um did talk about the different types of hikers out there so uh, section hikers day hikers and through hikers then there's also people on the trail that are not hikers that are associated with the trail community and these are called trail angels so trail angels are people that provide trail magic trail magic is anything that is provided to a hiker for free that could be from a ride uh, some snacks a drink medical supplies, whatever it is, a meal, a lot of times, I've gotten invited over for meals multiple times, um, that's, that's all trail magic. Um, there's going to be some opportunities on this trail where some of the hostels have online portals where if you want to provide trail magic to hikers, you can go online and say, uh, buy them a bed for the night. And, or you could just buy a couple beds and have them, you know, distributed to anybody that might need it. Things like that. Um, so that's a way to be a trail angel and not actually be on trail. Um, but trail angels are great and um, we appreciate them and we appreciate their trail magic. And um, looking forward to seeing some, some cool people out there. I'd say some of the best conversations that I've had have been with trail angels. And um, one of them that sticks out right now uh, is a guy that we met in Pinedale, Wyoming on the CBT where he was a triple crowner and um, said, let me give you a piece of advice from my experience. Take more pictures of people. You can Google the views at the tops of the mountains, but you'll want to remember the times you had with your friends more than anything else. And I can't think of a more truer statement about, about these types of trips is that, yeah, being on top of mountain bridges is great and it's spectacular, but the bonds of friendship that you develop over the course of these long, long, you know, hikes is so much more rewarding than some amazing view. Not that that isn't, isn't uh, rewarding at all, but, oh, I remember that tank. Yes, yeah, so we're pulling into Lordsburg now. Let's see. So you can see where that radio tower is on the other side of it is the um, where the trail comes from. So we're going to cross over the CDT um, right before we get to the station.
and this is uh, Interstate 10 that we've been riding along. <laughs> oh, I think this was the Loves. The Burn and Rod wanted to go to. I thought he said that there was a Arby's here. There is not an Arby's here. I'm glad that we didn't end up coming down here because that would have been disappointing. So the McDonald's is right by where, if you can even see it out there, is right by where the uh, trail is. Anyway, so let me make sure I can make sure I'm still in the frame. Um, and so we'll be trying to focus, I will be trying to focus on getting people as a result of that advice. Um, one of the other things that I just mentioned I want to make sure I define is the term tri triple crowner. Uh, triple crowner is uh, a designation that's given out by Alda West, which is the American Long Distance Hiking Association. And it, to receive that status, you have to hike the entire length of the Appalachian Trail, Continental Divide Trail, and the Pacific Crest Trail. And that is what I, I am working towards. Um, I've already hiked the Appalachian Trail and the Continental Divide Trail, so the second trail that I'm doing this summer is going to be the one that will uh, allow me to claim that title of Triple Crowner, the Pacific Crest Trail. And um, long story why I'm doing the AT this year, but it was kind of like an idea that some CDT friends had that I uh, thought was great. And they ended up not having their schedules work out, and I was like, it's still a great idea, I'm going to commit anyway. And so I'm out here doing both trails. PCT is honestly more important to me because that's what I need for the Triple Crown. So there is a non-zero chance that I'll bail on the AT um, to keep that that goal uh, attainable. So not expecting to, but it's a possibility. Um, yeah, so that's a Triple Crowner. I'm trying to think what else what else is there in terms of like people and hiking. Nothing I can think of at the moment, but if there is something that you'd like to know, comment section. I will be more than happy to answer. Try to answer in the comments and in the videos um, so that you don't have to wait for the answer, but I can give a better explanation in a recording. <laughs> and let me come right back after we get out of this station. Welcome back on the train, everybody. We are in Lulling, Texas. Had a pretty decent night of sleep. I was uh, surprised. Didn't more like uh, the train was rocking me to sleep than it was um, keeping me awake, which was super nice. Um, I do have a bit of heartburn. I think that might be because of uh, just nerves from getting on the train soon. But um, a little bit closer to the window. Okay, that's worse. This way. <laughs> anyway, um, so. Wanted to pick off or pick up where I was talking last time about people on the trail. Uh, one of the other terms that I wanted to talk about was because um, I will be using this pretty frequently is tramley. And a tramley is, um, and I apologize if you can't hear me that well. I'm trying to be respectful of the other people on the train, um, not as much soundproofing as uh, one would think. Anyway. Um, Tramley is a combination of trail and family, and it's basically the group that you hike with when you're on the trail. It's not necessarily the people that you hike with the entire time. Tramleys get together and break apart pretty frequently. When I say the entire time, I mean like the entire trail. So for example, on the AT, I kind of parted two tramleys in the beginning, and then that kind of morphed, broke apart, and got absorbed by a bigger tramley that was um, right around us at the same point. And then the CDT really um, didn't start getting into one until the Wind River Range. And then um, it kind of just grew from that point to the end of the trail, which was really nice. Anyway, um, kind of getting into the gear stuff now, I guess. So um, you guys have seen all the gear that I'm bringing and I uh, have a lighterpack.com list for everything. And uh, I guess gotta make sure I upload that sorry um so that is um just a breakdown of everything i've got what that is basically everything that's on there that's not 
listed as being worn is what's considered base weight. So base weight is all of the gear less consumables, water and food and fuel, typically fuel. Um, and I think we might be moving. Awesome. So what ultralighters try to do is target a base weight of about 10 pounds. Um, I don't. I don't know what mine weighs. I don't really care. Um, you get used to carrying the weight no matter what it is. And people with base weights up to, you know, 30, 40 pounds will, oh, here's the announcement, I bet, will be just fine. So my kind of philosophy with packing is get it down to the necessities. Over time, you realize what you do and don't need. But, like, if something brings you joy, bring it. Um, I like dry feet. I like not having blisters. The socks bring me joy, so I have a lot of those. Um, that's just what I think is the best way to go about it. So I purposely don't weigh my pack because I don't want to get involved into this, you know, competition to see who is the you know, lightest pack and who's the most badass and anything like that. I just think that's silly. Um, I'm all about just hiking your own hike and like taking whatever you want to bring that's going to make the uh, experience enjoyable. So that's why I've got the, a lot of the decisions that I've made are like that. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll get into more of it as we go along the trail, as uh, things come up, why I've decided to do different things, how I handle different situations. Um, continuing on with gear, one of the other things I did mention in one of the previous videos was um, hiker boxes. Hiker boxes are something that you find at hostels, hotels, uh, gear shops, other hiker frequented places along a trail, and it's basically like a lost and found. But it's not lost items, it's donated items. So people will take gear that they aren't using anymore that's still good, leave it there, maybe some extra food that they have, leave it there, and if someone is need in need coming up behind them, they can go through the box, take anything they want, uh, leave anything that they don't need, and then kind of just, it's a self-sustaining um, self process, I guess. Um, but that is what I was talking about with the Sawyer filter bags that I've been using as a scoop. Those, um, you'll see the hiker box is littered with all the, because when you buy a Sawyer filter, you can't buy just the filter. You have to buy like a bunch of other accessories too. So you'll find those like accessory bags all, all up and down the trail, particularly in the hiker boxes. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, the base weight, Tramley, hiker boxes, might have been it. Oh, <clears throat> I guess some logistics then. So, um, a lot of people in the past have asked, like, what do we eat and how do we get the food out there? Because we're not scavenging. This isn't a survival type situation at all. Um, not living off the land except for the water and um, all the food that we have is bought in a grocery store. Um, basically what is going to happen is every four to five days depending on where we are there's going to be an opportunity to get off trail, get into a town, uh, get to a grocery store and buy more food and typically it's going to be dehydrated foods, uh, crackers, jerky, instant rice, instant mashed potatoes, a lot of instant foods, um, those backpacker meals of course, um, but anything that's shelf stable we can kind of pack out. Cheeses are great, butter is great to pack out too, um, a lot of different stuff. Now that I've got a stove a lot of the options that I've got are going to be opened up. So um, like for example, and then there's other little, little differences. So like people don't pack out bread very often but they will pack out tortillas. Um, Cream cheese does surprisingly well outside of a refrigerator for like a five days, not a week maybe, but like five days for sure. And um, people bring out bagels and, you know, so there's like normal food out there, but a lot of it's like, I've got minute rice and instant refried beans. It'll be like my staple dinner for most of the trail. Um, anything that's about a hundred calories or more per ounce of weight is typically where you see hikers trying to buy. So we're not getting those 100 calorie packs, we're not getting the diet, low sugar, low fat, we're getting full force everything. Um, even with all of that, bumping up your intake to like 3,000 calories a day, if you're lucky, you're going to lose weight because you're going to be burning five to 6,000. So in town, typically you'll see a lot of people try to binge and just eat as much food as possible. Um, and then, you know, 
once or twice a week, that helps out a lot. But on the trail, we do like a lot of instant oatmeal, wraps, and um, freeze-dried foods. So that is, um, and we don't rely on the trail angels for anything. It's nice when the trail angels provide trail magic, but if you rely on trail magic for like sustenance, you're gonna have a bad time because they're not always guaranteed to be there. Uh, let's see. And then, oh, so this is the other thing. These clothes that I'm wearing are the only clothes that I have. <clears throat> are the only clothes that I have. So I will not be changing like shirts every day or clothing every day. I'm going to be in all of this every single day, every single night for the next nine months, except for when I'm in town doing laundry. And I'll probably just be in my uh, rain clothes, my rain pants and rain jacket, so that I can get this clean or semi clean for um, the next section. But that helps save a lot on the weight because you can't wear more than one set of clothing at a time. So why bring more than one set of clothing at a time? I used to bring more, but now I don't because um, you just don't need it. It ends up being dead weight. So I'd rather have that for more socks, for example, because I'm bringing more socks on this than I did last time, but my clothes probably weigh about the same. Um, and then I'm trying to think what other stuff I'd love to hear from you guys what your questions are, what um, aspects of the trail are you curious about, what doesn't make sense, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, answer those questions and shed some light onto the mysteries of being out on the trail for such a long time. But uh, hopefully a lot of that will be captured in the series that we're going to create. So I'm looking forward to that and also getting back on the move once this train decides to get going. Um, so other than that, I'll pop back in if there's anything I think of, but I think I covered all the kind of pre-hike, pre-hike, uh, terminology and ideas and just kind of like the background of like, what's good to know about how things typically go. Um, but certainly there's going to be more, more information to come. All right. I'm done stalling. I'll see you guys uh, a little bit later probably in New Orleans, but get some good footage on the way. Hopefully a sunset. Later.